Uh, we are in Luke chapter 18 today, looking at verses 1 through 14. Uh, and it's fitting that Luke 18, 1 through 14 is all about prayer. When I think about the motherly figures in my life, my own mom uh, or my godmother, anyone have a godmother? Remember back in the day, that was a thing that we did more often. Uh, my godmother, who still lives in the Midwest, she'll oftentimes text me at 8.08. Uh, my birthday is August 8th. If you want to put that in your calendar, you can. Um, no pressure, though. Uh, she'll text me 808 sometimes and say, hey, Thomas, thinking about you, love you, proud of you, praying for you. Um, quite frequently throughout the year, my Aunt Gwen, as I call her, she'll text me and just let me know she's praying for me. My mom continues to pray for me. My wife, a motherly figure in my life, um, she prays for me. My mother-in-law, she oftentimes prays for me. I mean, there's so many of the moms around me, maybe it's because I'm messed up, I don't know, probably, but they're all praying for me. And I think that can be true of many of us. When we look at the motherly figures in our life, they're just prayer warriors. And what we see in Luke 18, 1 through 14, is that it would be good of us to take a, a play out of their playbook and that we'd begin to pray like a mother, that we would begin um, to adopt that prayer life for ourselves. So Luke 18, 1 through 14, we have two parables of prayer. Um, one is the story of a widow, an unlikely hero in a character, someone who, uh, unlikely character in a story, someone who would have been looked down upon. And in the second story, we have a tax collector, another individual who would have been looked down upon. So it's two people that culture looks down upon that Jesus actually says when it comes to their prayer life, there's something to be learned for each and every one of us in this place. We'll see overall, man, God calls us to pray persistently. Uh, but three lessons I think we can learn from these two parables. Begins in chapter 18, verse one. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. They ought always to pray and not lose heart. I really love it when the Bible doesn't bury the punchline and it's not super hard to understand. Jesus gives us the main takeaway right away. What is it? We should pray more. When it comes to having a persistent prayer life, when it comes to having a good prayer life, more just seems to be a good principle to adopt. When you think about your relationships with your most loved ones, it's typically contingent upon good what? Communication. I don't think our relationship with God is all that different. I find that when communication shuts down between my, my, my wife and I, it seems like our relationship begins to suffer. Now, where our relationship status hasn't changed, she's still my wife and I'm still her husband. When we stop talking, things don't go well. It's the same thing with my kids. When I stop talking with my kids, if I'm upset with them and I just shut down, we can't work through it. Or if they're upset with me and they just stop talking and shut down, we can't work through it. When, relation, when communication shuts down, relationships begin to suffer. But when, when communication picks up, it's almost as if our relationships begin to flourish. I don't think this is all that different from our relationship with God. Why would God call us to pray more? Because he wants bigger and better and more relationship, more fellowship with each and every one of us. And this is where he starts. We ought to pray more. All the prayer warriors in my life, none of them would feel like, like they have reached the final goal. Right? We have an elder here at the church who wakes up oftentimes incredibly early in the morning, goes and prays for two hours, goes back to bed, wakes up, does his quiet time, and then goes about his day. If you ask that elder, do you pray enough or would you like to pray more? His answer every time is, I want to pray more. I want to pray more because there's more in it. There's more relationship to be had. There's more depth that I haven't tapped into yet. And that's what Christ invites us into in our relationship with the Lord. He invites us into more. How do we get there? Well, according to this, we ought to always pray and not lose heart. So Jesus tells them a story. He tells them a parable. He said this, in a certain city, there's two characters. A judge, when you think judge, think about a guy with lots of authority, lots of honor, lots of privilege, lots of fame, notoriety. And this guy, he's a bad guy. He neither fears God nor respects men. And there was a widow. When you think of widow, think opposite of judge. You had judge with power. Now you have a widow, vulnerable. 
Someone who's needs, she's just, she needs help from other people. Her, uh, the good in her life is contingent upon other people showing up and providing and protecting for her. It's the opposite of the judge, but it's this widow, this vulnerable widow that God says we might have something to learn from. And in that city, there was a widow who kept coming to the judge and saying, give me justice against my adversary. Jesus doesn't let us in on what the situation may be. All we know is we have an adversary, someone working against this widow. So this widow continues coming to the judge, the guy who can do something about it. And she wants justice. What's justice? It's either punishment for the adversary or protection from the adversary. But the request is for justice. For a while, the judge refused, but afterwards he said to himself, uh, and it's nice, this guy at least is clear about who he is, though I neither fear God nor respect man, he knows he's the bad guy, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Beat me down in the Greek is an idiom for give me a black eye. Jesus says this in verse six, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Let's hear it. What is it that the unrighteous judge says? Here's what he says. I'm a bad guy. I don't fear God. I don't respect men. And this woman is needy and she's annoying. I don't want to help her. But so she leaves me alone, I'll give her what she wants. Now, when we read a story like this, we'll start wondering, okay, is this like a comparison thing? Like, is God like the unrighteous, angry judge? Or is it a contrasting thing? It's a contrasting thing. The point of the parable is not God is an unhappy judge who will give you what you want so you leave him alone. That's not the point. In fact, our God, our perfect God, God the Father, who's righteous and just, who created everything, who loves us, who invites us into relationship with him, is different than this unrighteous judge. We studied months ago Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, there was a similar story. There's a father in his house, and in this house, all of his children have gone to sleep, and they share a bed. Culturally, that's what it would have been like, a big one-bedroom home with a bed that everyone would sleep in together, a little different than our split floor plans where our kids are way down there, way, 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 way down there, and we're way, 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 way down here. It was the type of thing where you were together. And in this story, a friend comes and knocks on the door after the father and all the children have gone asleep. Isn't that your favorite thing when the kids finally go to sleep and then someone rings the doorbell? We love it in our house. No, not at all. Uh, In fact, remember this, maybe you still have a baby in the house or you recall when you had a baby at home and when the newborn went down, oftentimes you'd take a sticky note and you'd put it on your front door and you'd say, for the love of God, do not ring this doorbell. The baby is sleeping. Go away (laughs) or text us. That's kind of the mood that this father's in. A friend comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, do you have some bread? A friend of mine just came in from a long travel and I forgot to make bread. Do you have any bread? And the father says, go away. Go away, my kids are asleep. But the persistent friend continues knocking on the door and the friend says, so that you will go away and let my kids sleep, I'll give you what you want. Similar heart behind this judge. I don't fear God. I don't respect man, but so you'll leave me alone, I'll give you what you want. That's the heart of man, that's not the heart of God. You can read a similar parable in Matthew chapter seven or you can read it in uh, the same story in Luke chapter 11, where it says we know how to give good gifts, don't we? Parents, moms, dads, we know how to give give good gifts to our children. If our child asks for a loaf of bread, we don't give them a rock. Or if they ask for a piece of fish, it's not as if we give them a scorpion or as if we give them a snake. He goes on and says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will our Father in heaven who is perfect give much better things to those who would ask? See, that's the point. Our God is not like this unrighteous judge. Our God is not like this selfish man who just wants to be left alone, who will give us what we want if we bother him enough. That's not the point. The point is our God is good. Our God loves us and invites us in to praying like this persistent widow, that we'd come to him daily with our needs, that we'd come to him daily with anything. 
we need to pray more. Hear what this unrighteous judge says, verse seven, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? If this unrighteous judge gives this widow what she needs, how much more will our God, a righteous, perfect, completely loving and holy father, give things to us who cry to him day and night? So the second thing, we need to pray faithfully. Okay, we need to pray more, whatever that means to you. A, a good starting place is just more. Not exactly, what's the, what, what's the magic recipe? How exactly do I need to pray? Uh, Jesus left some great examples for us for how to pray, but also he just said, pray more. One of the best places to start if you wanna pray is just do it. How frequently, as frequently as you can, just pray more, pray faithfully, pray persistently. And when I say pray faithfully, we'll return to this towards the end. Um, I also wanna challenge us to try to pray biblically. Try to pray biblically. There are all sorts of prayers modeled for us throughout the scriptures and if we wanna follow Jesus, we follow Jesus' teaching to pray more, to pray faithfully. We also follow Jesus' example. What does it look like for us to pray? What types of things did Jesus pray for? How do we join him in that? When we pray, we ought to pray persistently without ceasing, without giving, uh, giving up heart, without losing heart. We should pray often, but we should also pray faithfully. Verse eight, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man, man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? On earth, and what I mean by he means by faith is not just will he find people doing all the right things and saying all the right things. Okay, anything that does not proceed from faith is actually a sin. Anything that does not proceed from um, our relationship with the Lord, built upon the righteousness of Christ, anything detached from that, the Bible says, is sinful. So when Jesus comes back, and this is what we studied last week, and Jesus is coming back. Um, when? I'm not entirely sure. What I know is he's closer today than he was yesterday and he's closer tomorrow than he is today and so on and so forth and God has called us to live with that perspective. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes to us or when we pass on and go to him, will we be found faithful? Will we be found having a faith not of our own but a faith that comes from him? Not a faith of works, but a faith apart from works. Will we be found having a faith fully devoted to who Christ is and what he's done for us? Will we be found with the faith that says, I'm only righteous because Christ was righteous? Is our faith in Christ and in Christ alone? John 14, 6 says, Jesus says this, for I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me is our faith in Jesus. Why would we put our faith in Jesus? Why do I need to put my faith in Jesus? Well, the Bible says all have sinned, each and every one of us, and because of that, we've been separated from God. We have fallen short of the glory of God. God's standard for us to be in relationship with him is perfection. Any perfect people in church this morning, keep your hand down. I don't want to ruin the streak. Bible says we have sin. What sin? God says, live this way, do this. And we say, uh, not really my thing. He says, actually, don't do this. And we say, but I like that, it feels good and it's fun. We sin, we break God's laws. And because we have sin in our life, we've been separated from God, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were sinners, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He died the death that you and I deserve to die. Why? The wages of sin is death. So Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. The scriptures go on. They say Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, defeating death. That if we'd place our faith, our trust in Christ and in Christ alone, that so too you and I could live forever. We could live abundantly now and we can live eternally with Christ later. When Jesus comes back or when we go to him, will we be found faithful? Not because of what we say, not because of what we do, but because of who Christ is and what we say about him. That's the question, will we be found faithful? Jesus tells a second 
parable. It's the parable of a tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. You got two things going against them right away. They trusted in themselves. Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. The Thomas translation says, trust God, not Thomas. It's what it says. Trust God, not you. So if we're trusting in self, we've already missed it. And what are they trusting in self for? They're trusting in their own works. They're trusting in their own righteousness. But Romans 3.10 says, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one does good, no one seeks God. Apart from Christ, no one's righteous. So these guys have it wrong immediately. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Here's the parable. Two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. If you're hearing this story, immediately you might think, well, it's the Pharisee who's the hero. It's the religious guy, the one who acts the part, prays the part, uh, looks the part. It's got to be this guy who's going up into the temple. He is the religious one, not the tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed like this. Matthew chapter six talks about Pharisees, how they stand on the street corners as they pray to get all of the attention. Not taking attention and taking it off them and bringing people to the feet of Jesus and bringing the attention to God. Their goal was to bring all the attention to themselves. So they would stand by themselves. That's exactly what's happening in this story. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. God I thank you. That's a great way to start. That's the only thing he does right in this entire prayer as he thanks God. I don't know about you, but I find myself lately when I'm praying and I thank God, it's like the list of things I'm thankful for, for what he's doing in my life and just who he is in general. When I'm thanking God, it's like that list could never end. It's a great way to start. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. He does that part right uh, and falls apart shortly after that. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. In other words, hey God, you're welcome. He's got an eye problem. His whole prayer is looking at himself. He's looking at him, who he is, what he's done, his, his faithfulness, what he brings to the table. Hey God, you're welcome. I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, in other words, cheaters and thieves, unjust, just all the other sinners, adulterers, sexual sinners, or even like this tax collector. Now, if you're thinking of this story, you have to realize how offensive and rude this would be. God, thank you that I'm like this. Thank you that I'm like this. Thank you that I'm not like this other guy. Here's what this looks like. God, thank you that I'm better than everyone else. God, thank you that I'm not like these bad husbands. Thank you that I'm not like these bad fathers, these bad friends, these cheaters and poor businessmen. And God, thank you especially that I'm not like my friend Brian. That's pretty messed up. That's pretty messed up. This guy is way too high on his horse. I love Brian. He's my best friend. I can say anything. He's not offended. Are you offended? I am thankful that I'm not like you, though. It's okay. (laughs) Just kidding. I love you. This guy has got an eye problem. It's I, 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 God. Hey, God, you're welcome. God, you're lucky to have me on your team. God, you're lucky to have me as a part of your family. God, you're lucky to have me as a part of your church. It's just totally prideful. God doesn't like pride. We'll see that in a moment. He says, I fast twice a week. I do all the things. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You have one guy standing on a platform getting all the attention, much like this, basically saying, God, you're welcome. You're welcome. Look at how great I am. 
And you have another man, a tax collector, a reject, an outsider, someone who wouldn't even be welcomed by those who were a part of the temple, standing where? Far off in the corner where no one can see. And in all humility, not even lifting his eyes to heaven, instead beating his chest like sometimes we often do. And he just says, God, be merciful to me. I have nothing to bring you. Be merciful to me, a sinner. So we see we need to pray more. We need to pray faithfully, but also we need to pray in humility. We need to pray in humility and pray for humility. Sometimes we think way too highly of ourselves than we really should. Verse 14, I tell you, this man, this humble tax collector, went down to his house justified, in other words, right in the eyes of God, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. James chapter four, verse six says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you want the God of the universe to be against you? Then be a prideful person. Exalt yourself higher than you ought to, and the God of the universe will be opposed to you. But if you want the God of the universe to exalt you, to lift you up, then humble yourselves. Realize who we really are, that we bring nothing to the table except our sin. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's the great exchange. We come to the table as sinners asking God for mercy, saying, Jesus, will you take my sin? And then we freely and gladly receive the righteousness of Christ. It's the good news of the gospel. We humble ourselves because Jesus humbled himself. The God of the universe didn't account equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and came here and humbled himself even further than that by taking a cross. That in him, if we'd we'd humble ourselves and place our faith in Christ, then we'd be exalted to live in right relationship with God forever. We need to pray in humility, recognize who God is and who we're even speaking with, but we also need to pray for humility that we'd humble ourselves and in doing so, God would exalt us and do with our life what he chooses to do. Persistent prayer, two great parables, two people, unlikely heroes in a story, coming before the Lord and asking for help persistently. Three things I think we can take away. We just need to pray more. We need to pray more. I'm not sure what your prayer life looks like, but praying more is a good place to start. What would that look like for you to pray more. Maybe right now you're, uh, we pray before meals. That's a great, great way to do that. Okay, Jesus like fed the 5,000 and before he did the whole miracle, he turned his eyes to heaven. He thanked God for who he is and what he was about to do. It seems like a good thing that we should practice as well. Pray before you eat. That's great. Maybe you stop there. Can you pray more? What would it look like to wake up and sing the old song and pray the old song? This is the day, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. To set our eyes and our hearts on heaven immediately when we wake up. What would it look like to pray more? Second thing, what would it look like to pray faithfully? I'm gonna invite the band out to join me as we close. What would it look like for us to pray faithfully? Yes, persistently. Yes, without ceasing. But also, what would it look like for us to pray biblical things? To pray what we see modeled in the scriptures. We want to follow Jesus, which means we follow his teaching, but we also follow his example. We want to follow God, so we follow his teaching. We also follow the example of the people we see in the scriptures. What would it look like for us to pray faithfully, persistently, but also to pray biblically? I taught you a little acronym months ago as we were studying through Luke chapter 11. I want to reteach it slash remind you if you hadn't heard it before, it's just P-R-A-Y. How do we pray faithfully? P-R-A-Y, P is praise. Well, where do we see praise modeled in the scriptures? Open up the Psalms, open up the Psalms. There's praise everywhere. There's praise everywhere, even the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who's in heaven. That's a statement of praise, a recognition of who God is. We're praising God, realizing he's the maker of everything. He's a sustainer of everything. We begin our prayers, our faithful prayers with praise. R is repent. 
repent. You could look at Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. We come before the Lord realizing we have nothing great to offer him. We repent of our sin, we turn away from our sin, confess Christ to be our Lord, and continue walking in faith and living a life that loves him, that honors him, that brings him glory. We repent, or we ask. It's okay to ask God things. Philippians chapter four, verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in all things, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay, and here's what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean God's got no idea what's going on until we ask him about it. That's not the point. He knows what's going on. He's got the whole world in his hands. He knows every situation. He knows every detail of everything going on in all of our lives, all at the same time. But we come before him in humility and we ask. And just like this persistent widow went to the judge persistently, day after day, all night and all day. Why? Because she believed this judge could actually do something about it. Well, that's our heart too. We come before God, our perfect, righteous, holy, loving Father. Why? Because we believe he can actually do something about it. So we let our requests be made known to the Lord. We bring our asks, our wants, our desires before the Lord, ultimately with a spirit and a heart that says, God, but your will be done, not my will. That's the why, we yield. We yield. Open-handed prayers saying, God, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this situation as it is in heaven. We have people coming to the church all the time asking for prayer. They've got sickness going on and and they need the Lord to show up and do something miraculous. And we will ask the Lord, we'll plead with the Lord, God, would you do something amazing? Would you heal them? Would you heal them for an amazing testimony for the good of this person and the glory of your son Jesus so all people around can see that you did a miraculous thing in the life of this person? We're not afraid to ask. But at the same time, we pray, God, but we know your plan is way better than ours. And we submit ourselves to your will. We submit ourselves to your way. We realize that you work all things for your glory and for our good, so you work this situation however you need. It's a yielding prayer. We give that situation over to God. We pray faithfully. And then third thing, we need to pray in humility. And do you see yourselves accurately or do you have an eye problem? When you come before the Lord, is it all about the great things you bring to the table? When you come before the Lord, is it as if, man, I've earned this? Or do you see yourself in light of Ephesians 2? I was dead in my trespasses and sins. But by grace, I've been saved through faith, not by anything that I've done, only because of what Christ Jesus has done. Do we humble ourselves in prayer? Do we pray for God to continue to humble us so we can live the way of Jesus and live a life that looks like Jesus? We need to pray more. We need to pray faithfully. I need to pray in humility and for humility. I'm gonna give us an opportunity as we close today to pray. So I'm gonna ask you right where you're at, bow your heads, close your eyes, um, and we're gonna pray for just a couple minutes. For some of you, this is like, an appetizer to the actual main course of prayer. For others, this may feel like an eternity. But wherever we're at, we're just gonna talk to God and have a conversation with him. We're gonna communicate with the God of everything. Let's just praise him in your own words, in the quietness of your heart. Would you praise God for who he is? Would you repent? Would you lay your sins at the feet of the cross? Would you bring those things that you've been hiding to Jesus and say, God, I turn these over to you and I turn away from them? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Would we ask, ask God to move for his glory 
and for our good in whatever situation we're facing in our life. And would you yield? Not your will, but his will be done. Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that the creator and sustainer of the universe knows us by name. That the God of all creation has called us into relationship with him through his son. Thank you, Father. God, we do turn away from the things of this world. We turn away from the things that steal our attention, that steal our affection. God, the sins that we continue to struggle with, Lord, we repent of those, we turn from them and follow you in faith. Father, I ask that you would continue to work by the power of your spirit, God, that you would um, open people up even in this place here, right here, right now, God, that you would open their ears to hear you, their eyes to see you, their minds to know you, their hearts to love you. And that for my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ who do know you and desire to follow you and speak of you, God, that you would embolden them and give them courage to open their mouth when they leave this place to speak of how good you are. God, ultimately we yield. God, not my will, but thy will be done. God, that you'd have your way in me, that you'd have your way in the lives of all who are here this morning. God, everything we do say and sing is only because we want to glorify you. God, we love you, praise you, give you all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Hey, our prayer team is gonna be down front. Maybe you're going through some stuff and just want some prayer. And this team would love to pray with you. They'd love to pray for you. Maybe you've got some great stuff going on. You just want to rejoice and praise God for who he is and what he's doing. They would love to pray with you and praise God um, for what's happened in your life as well. Maybe you're here in this place this morning and you have questions about what it means or looks like to have faith to follow Jesus. We would love to have a conversation with you. Um, I'll be down front after the service. I'd love to talk with you. You can fill out a connect card and say you want to follow Jesus. We'd love to reach out this week and talk with you. Um, or you can go to the giant glowing sign that says follow Jesus after the service. And that team back there would love to pray with you as well. This week, would we press in to our relationship with the Lord? Would we do whatever it takes for whatever it looks like for each and every one of us? Would we try to pray more? Would we talk to God more this week than we did this last week? Would we pray faithfully, not just persistently, but also do our best to pray biblical prayers, pray things in line with what the scriptures teach? And also, would we pray in humility, but also for humility, that we would walk the way, the humble way of Jesus this week? Moms, we love you. We hope this day that you feel honored, loved. Uh, we hope you feel rejoiced over. Um, just know that we see you, we care for you, and we are incredibly thankful for each and every one of you. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Love each other. Go live on mission. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.